The title of my presentation is uh, issues of, uh, I think you have it somewhere, issues uh, around the movement towards new indicators of wealth and development. So what is important here is that there is a heterogeneous movement and that's what I will uh, discuss about are new, so what is new is a good question, new indicators of wealth, development, and probably other, other stuff, other concepts such as well-being, quality of life, etc., etc. This, this is a very odd uh, subject uh, for uh, mainstream economics, but it is uh, even, um, it is studied by them. My introduction is the following. I will present you what is our uh, hegemonic rep collective representation of what is wealth. Do you have any idea of what is this hegemonic collective representation of what is wealth? Okay, so, good. I don't know where you're from, so it's, a co it's, 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 it's for me um, the occasion of, 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 of having an idea of what uh, you, you may understand. So my introduction is that it is becoming a universal convention, convention, and it's becoming, becoming more and more cumbersome, broad, something very vague, and I will, I will try to, to, to tell you some stuff about that. So I will just give you my definition, but it's a very common one, of what GDP is. And, and then I will discuss some stuff about it. GDP, as it is um, commonly used, is the monetary value. So what is important here is that it is uh, the language used for GDP is money, monetary value of the, all the finished goods and services produced within a country's border within a year. Okay? And uh, it, it also includes the government expenses. And the government expenses are included within the border of GDP because um, uh, it is supposed to be a proxy of what government produces, right? So in, in a way, GDP is all things that are produced by economic units, being their uh, uh, economic units firms and in individual uh, uh, enterprises and government, right, administration. It has become, GDP has become, within less than four decades, our collective convention and universal of wealth. Collective convention means that I have to tell you some stuff about convention, universal Au revoir. Je suis désolée, mais finalement, c'est dans l'autre sens. Et ça aurait été bien. Um, so, and, and, and I may also add something. GDP is a collective, and I could add something, synthetic, con universal convention of wealth. Okay. Why is it universal? Because the metrics it uses, the metric it uses is um, um, is a way to benchmark all countries. It is very powerful because of its capacity of benchmarking all countries. Being these countries uh, in very in very uh, heterogeneous uh, social organizations, right? So this is this is a very important uh, aspect of the power of GDP. It's universal uh, feature. The second thing which is quite important is that GDP has the capacity of summarizing within one indicator very, very heterogeneous activities. And this is also very powerful. In France, it represents two billion of euros per year. So 
when saying that, it, it's very powerful to say that GDP represents 2 billion euros. Powerful because it's synthetic. You say it within one word, or two words, two billion. And it can, it, it can circulate, you know, it's like tweets now, tweet, t t Twitter, Twitter, mm -hmm. Twitter, that can circulate very easily. And, and, it, is, and, and, it, and it gathers very different stuff within the GDP. Within the GDP, you have, at the same time, production of, um, of agricultural goods, food. You also have all the manufacturer goods. And you also have production of services, that is to say, insurance, transport, health, education, elderly care, but also um, maintenance for destruction of nature is part of GDP, but also psychotrop production, which is part of GDP. And even now in Italy, prostitution and drug traffic, right? And one of the reasons is that GDP is regarded by economists as being an indicator which is amoral and ethic. It doesn't mean that there is no ethic from my point of view, but it is the way it has been uh, uh, designed in a way. Amoral, amoral doesn't mean immoral. <laughs> Just they do not want to take into account either ethical, ethical aspects nor moral aspects. So it's it's it's, univer it's it's universal feature and its synthetic feature feature are two features that that renders the GDP very powerful, very very powerful. And now I want to spend a, a few minutes on the the idea that GDP is a convention. GDP is not um, something that could be regarded as being an atemporal tool. It has been constructed, constructed um, we could say that GDP is a social construct, right? It is a so social construct. It has been constructed in a very specific context when nations were trying to have a attempt of building national accounts, in the United States, the what we say sometimes, the inventor of DGP is Simon Kuznets, <laughs> who, in the uh, after the Great Depression, during the 30s, has uh, written reports on. Uh, national income, national income for, for the United States. So you have the very, uh, um, you have the grants here, the, the, the very grants of what GDP is now, national income. And, and the, here are the attempts of, of having within one indicators uh, the overall flows within a year that, that circulates uh, within a territory, here the nation, and so, and, and so, and, and of course the idea of Kuznets is to have an indicator that would try to avoid new Great Depression as the one had, that had occurred during the 1929, and at the same time, uh, it also wanted to prepare United States to an um, expected world war. So it, pr it wanted, the, the indicator was there also to know to what extent the United States would be prepared to an international war. Right? Prepared in a sense of uh, what, what, what would be the power of industry and what would be the capacity of feeding people. Food, agriculture, industry, manufacturing. After World War II, in, uh, uh, in all the Western countries, you 
almost all Western countries set up systems of national accounts. And the system of national accounts systems of national accounts uh, uh, were the overall system that permits GDP to be uh, to be calculated, right? But of course I could just present you the story as being the one that Kuznets had organized in the in the 30s, but I have another way of telling you the story of GDP, and the one I will I will use now, I borrowed from François Fourquet. Unfortunately, his book is not uh, translated into English, but François Fourquet has written a book in 91 called uh, Les Contes de la Puissance. power accounts and what he what he describes in his book is the story of how all the all the politicians in the 40 during after World War II the politicians and, and experts in economics try to elaborate convention of an indicator that we that would um, that would um, be a good representation of the, of the power of the nation. The power of the nation. And the genealogy of what he presents is very clear on that point. And you will see later that one of, one of the ideas is uh, show me what your GDP is and I will tell you what is your power. See what is told these days concerning the, 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 the ranking of, of China, concerning its, its GDP. There has been a lot of buzz concerning that these last days. And François Fourquet uh, explains very clearly in his book that GDP has been constructed for to, to, uh, to accompany, okay, to accompany uh, the political strategy of reconstructing the nations, the Western nation, on an industrial basis. And this is very understandable because the countries were completely destroyed. So, of course, we, there was a need of having an indicator that would try to to tell whether or not the reconstruction on an industrial <coughs> basis was on the way or not. The progress for industrial reasons, in a way. And also, and this has to do, also, of course, to, to contest somehow the communist countries, on a uh, market side. So what was the expansion of the market, right? So if you do not understand of if you do not have in, 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 your ha in your head the idea that the national account system were aimed at a reconstruction on an industrial on sorry on an industrial basis and on the basis of a market expansion, you cannot understand what GDP is today, right? And m we might have other aims. We might have at this time wanted to create rural society. I'm not sure to pronounce it very <laughs> clearly. Rural societies. <laughs> rural societies, it's maybe clearer. And, uh, and, and with, with, for instance, the functions of, of having a quality of food, which was absolutely not the case. Industrial, in, industrial bases mean an obsession of volumes more is always better more and more is always better and and also maybe um, uh, landscape uh, organization function which has not been the case uh, concerning what happened after world war ii <coughs> of course um, um i may i may also 
add two, two ideas concerning this social construct. Maybe to try to convince you that uh, GDP is really a convention and that the, f the borders of, of GDP may have had completely different. I do not say that it would have been better, I just said it may have been different. And one of them is the fact that uh, the treatment of um, public administration of public administration services, let's put it this way, service rendu par les administrations publiques. In 1945, um, public administration services were out of GDP. GDP was taking into account only activities that were offered on the market, only activities that were offered, supplied on the market, right? In 19... 71 to 3 let's say 3 in 1973 there have been there has been an, a new uh, a, a new national account system or system of national accounts a new system of national accounts including public administration services this was a revolution in a way or this may be seen as a revolution if 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 we see it from from now why? First, because this way of including these uh, public administration services within GDP was implicitly saying that public service administration or uh, public administration services, sorry, uh, were producing wealth. Wow! They are producing wealth. They are not just costs, huh? This is a new way of presenting things. Of course, you may tell me, um, but how do we estimate things that are not rendered, offered, supplied on the market side? What sort of prices are used? You may have the answer. The, the, the principle that is used, because of course uh, it is a synthetic and GDP is given in, 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 in price, in, in euro or in dollar. And the idea which is uh, followed is the following. Um, public administration services produce at least what they cost. They produce at least what they cost. Well, or what the, their cost is. So more or less, my production is my wage, right? The more I'm paid, the more I produce. Strange convention, right? But interesting, interesting convention. Not that strange, actually. Um, but it's strange when you regard to austerity policies. It may be strange. Right. So that's my first point. And, and of course, when you ask statisticians the reason why they included uh, public administration services within the border of GDP, their answer is very technical. They never have a, 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 a wide story concerning that. They say, because we needed at that time international comparison international comparisons. And it's true that it is the beginning of the hegemony of OECD, of uh, UNDP, or, or United Nations, etc., etc. And one of the functions of OECD is to try to produce uh, indicators which will, um, uh, which will favor rivality between countries. I, I could even say competition with uh, between countries, rivality between countries. If you want to know which of the countries is the most powerful, 
Either you do war, and you see who has the biggest military uh, team, or you see which one has the biggest GDP. And this is a symbolic way of having a rivality. And, and read, read the newspapers concerning what happened to China these last days. And you will see that it is completely obvious. And of course, this, also is, this is also a, a factor favoring a competition between countries or so. But the, the better growth you have, or the highest growth you have, and the, the, the most powerful you seem to be. It's, it's the case of Germany for, for the moment, for instance. Although its growth is not very, uh, very, uh, very dynamic. But of course, so if you, if you, if you give a technical explain, explanation, you say it's for international comparisons. And of course, including uh, public administration services was meaning uh, in some countries, some services were supplied on a non-market side, on a non-market way. For instance, in France, here, and you know that, most of health and education are non-market activities. If we had used the 1945 convention, there would be non-comparable to countries who had marketized education and wealth. So they had decided to try to, what we would say in sociology, to try to produce functional equivalent between, between countries, equivalent functionnel. But of course, another story would be, it's also because there was a, a political willingness to do so. If there had not been any political willingness to include within GDP public administration services, there would probably be there would probably be not included those these days, and we may even, but this is all, only an hypothesis. We may even think today should public administration services not yet been within GDP, it would be very very difficult. To, to accept to that, because the, the representation we have concerning public administration as being seen as a cost and not as producing wealth would, would impeach, in a way, to, to be included within GDP. Treatment of public administration is one, uh, is one example of the fact that GDP is a convention and is a social construct. It may the borders may, 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 be, may change from time to time. I have another example, which is the production of um, domestic production. I should say, to be very precise, I should say um, uh, um, domestic activities. You know those... Um, this big uh, amount of activities that are being done on a non-market and, and, and non-monetary way within the household and, and uh, mostly done by women. So what happened in 1945? Actually, I found a text within which Kuznets was hesitating. And this text is very interesting. He was hesitating. Should we put these activities done by women within GDP? Is it wealth? Or should we let it outside? And they, they answer in a very odd way, which I always find interesting. Within domestic activities, you have two different uh, line, uh, two different um, uh, domains. One is, um, I'm not sure of, of, of the words I will use, but one is um, production for, of, for your, for, for our accounts. Is it occupied dwellings? Sorry? Is it home occupied dwellings? Home occupied? Dwellings. Uh, 
dwellings. What dwellings? That means it's like your own house, and then you stay. Oh no! This is a this is a something else. This is a what we call a, a, um, no. It, this is not what I mean. It, it's really domestic activities. It's when you you're caring your children, when you're doing your house. Uh, when you're cleaning your house, when you're doing your, uh, when you do it yourself uh, to, 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 to maintain your house, etc., etc. What you call is, uh, in French, it's called the uh, loyer fictif. Loyer fictif. It's, it's, it's uh, the equivalent of what uh, you would have paid for your own house. Yeah. But it is not what, uh, what I have here in mind. It's, it's more uh, on the real side of the activities. Production for our own accounts. So what is meant by production for our own accounts is it, it may seem very marginal for you, but at, in 1945 it was not that marginal. It's when you, you do your huh, potager, I have absolutely no idea of, of, of how to call it in, in, in English. Potager, you know you have these small gardens and you have your carrots your, yeah. and you do it for yourself. I have no idea of what would this, uh, if you have an idea of the name, potager. No, no one? Huh? Produce. Yeah, but but how would you call this uh, piece of garden where you do your carrots? The vegetable mm. garden. Huh? <laughs> okay, let's put it vegeta vegetable okay. garden. Okay, so potager, or, or you may also... Um, and you also have, within this production for own accounts, you also have the do-it-yourself. Uh, when you, you do some maintenance of your own house, what we call in France bricolage. And, but the, 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 the do it yourself that you do yourself for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And so domestic activities include this. You do your own, uh, for instance, jam, right? All this uh, confiture, right? It's jam, okay. And on the other side, you have also all the care services. But, but I mean care services doing for yourself or your children or your husband or your wife for the people within your own household, right? If domestic activities had to be excluded from GDP, we may have think, we may have uh, thought, we may have thought that all would be excluded from GDP. This is not what has been chosen. What has been chosen is to have an estimate of these activities, which are part of GDP, production for own accounts, but to exclude care activities. So I can give you an, a technical, again, I can give you a technical explanation and I can give you a, a, a more socioeconomic or uh, sociologist uh, uh, um, explanation. The technical explanation is the fact that it has been decided, and this Vanoli explained it very, very clearly in his book, uh, The History of National Accounts. Uh, they have they have chosen the idea of chargeability um, <coughs> potential. Uh, potential <coughs> um, huh, exchangeability. Huh, I'm not sure of the of the English term again. Um, the the capacity of an activity to be uh, to be to be done on the market, right? So potential ex exchangeability or something like that, or marketization, but it is potential. It does not mean that it is market, market marketed. It, it does not mean that it is marketed, but it may be marketed. So in 1945, it was supposed that when you were growing your own carrots or doing your do-it-yourself or doing your, your, your own jam. Yeah, jam? Yes. Okay. But this was potentially exchangeable on the market. But when you were doing the care for children, it was not exchangeable. As if manufactured produced, produce were intrinsically more exchangeable than services, right? Of course, today this is very strange, <coughs> at least for French people, because they, 
they outsource all their activities con well, when they have the, the means to do so, when they can afford it. They outsource all the activities of, of cleaning house, of, of having their children taken care of by, by other people, etc., etc. So there is an exchangeability. But in 1945, it was supposed not to be so. And there is another story, and the other story is to say that this production for own account, when it, when it has to do with, uh, uh, with the vegetable garden, thank you, or do it yourself, were dominantly done by men whereas care services were dominantly done by women. And it has been decided, but you may not follow my explanation, it has been decided to include activities when done for yourself if they were dominantly done by men and not activities when dominantly done by women. This is a story of the account of, of the power account. Who designed also at that time a GDP? I had a, a very nice picture that would show you that GDP, when it has been used since the 1944 Bretton Wood meeting, only men were, were within the meeting uh, Br of Bretton Wood. Okay, so GDP is hegemonic. GDP is a social construct. It may have included other things. And my th my fourth point is that GDP. Uh, he is, um, as, uh, has always been, um, uh, or has always faced criticisms, right? So there have always been limits underlined by different set of, 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 of experts concerning uh, GDP. But I think that there are two different uh, sets of limits. The first set of limits are what we, what we could call internal limits. I find, I find this, sec this uh, classification of internal limits and external limits very heuristic. That's the reason why I present them to you. But it does not <coughs> mean that uh, external limits. What I mean by uh, internal limits is the fact that it... it, it what? Internal limits have to do with the technical configuration of, of the tool and the, uh, the internal logic of the tools. And I will tell you some stuff concerning internal, internal limits of GDP which has understudied, which are very, very seldom studied by experts. And what are the most known limits which very clearly explain the reason why now we have this heterogeneous movement towards new indicators of wealth and development are the external limits. But I would like to spend five minutes on the internal limits, if, you, if I may so. The, the, the internal limits or internal critics have to do with the following idea. I, I will try to be as clear as possible. The idea is the following. Um, <coughs> in 2014, GDP in most Western countries includes se more than 70% of service activities. I may stop here, but I will explain you why this may be a problem. You, have, you, you, you keep in mind the fact that GDP was a very good indicator for a reconstruction on an industrial basis. I've never used the name services. I use it for public administration services, but not yet for the 70%. It's very much. So, most of Western countries do not produce goods anymore. They educate, they take care of people, they cure, they care, they cure, they, they transfer uh, information, they, they, um, okay, they do all those things, they, 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 give, uh, they give advice, etc., etc., but they do not produce goods at least for the two-thirds of them. 
So services are very much leading in, in, in GDP in, in Western countries. And there are difficulties in measuring the value added of services. Of course, I have in mind the fact that GDP is the sum of value added. But this, of course, you know. Measuring the value added of services, not much the nominal value added, but the real value added, or what we call the value added in volume. Why is it so important? Why is it so important to have an idea of the value added of services? Because, of course, GDP is a very interesting indicator, very hegemonic, but there is another indicator which is even more hegemonic in, most, in our collective representation, and this indicator is growth. You may say, but it's almost the same. Hmm. More or less, growth. Growth is the variation, time variation of GDP volume, in volume. So it's the variation of the sum of value added in volume again. And how do we shift from <coughs> nominal term to, to volume? Of course you know that. How do we shift from nomi nominal terms of uh, the value to volume? By, by price yeah, price. indeed, exactly. So you will have uh, you will have a variation of GDP in volume, which is growth, <coughs> right? This is what I wrote here, which is the ratio of variation of so I would say the sum of value added in volume on the variation of an index of price. Price index. Price index, yes, but in a way, if you want to, it, actually, it's not really inflation. It's a produce price index. It's almost the same, but it's not completely the same. So it's a general price index, let's say. Let's put it this way, general price index, right? The problem is the following. If I do the same, OK, let's put it uh, sum of value added in volume term. If I want to have an idea of the value added in volume of some service branches, for instance, elderly care, for instance, health, for instance, education. And I'm not so much concerned uh, about the fact that it is market or non-market uh, organized. What, what would I, 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 will, I will need the value added in, in, in uh, sorry, this is nominal term, sorry, sorry, in nominal terms of value, the value of, of value added, and, um, and, the, and, and the, the price index of the branch. The problem is the fact, do we say value added or added value, by the way? Value added. Value added? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, the problem is that to have prices, to have relevant prices, so relevant prices means the price that, uh, ha that express something concerning their vari variation uh, during time, there are two important uh, <coughs> elements to take into account. There must be um, there must be the possibility, I would say, capacity of identifying uh, the uh, a unit of production. I will give you an example just after that, and the quality must be stable within time, right? This is very important. 
the, 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 the possibility of having relevant prices for different branches of, of, of to, 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 to shift from nominal term to volume terms need relevant prices and relevant prices need two important things, two important features, capacity of identifying a unit of production and the quality must be stable during time. Okay. A unit of production in the automobile production, I see what it means. A car. Table, I see. A table. Uh, a, a bread. A baguette. You know what a baguette is? Necessarily, or, or you, you have not spent that much time in France. Baguette, <coughs> so it has always the same form, the same shape, the same uh, weight. It's very standardized. So all this is very, very easy to, to capture prices and their evolution within time. And the quality is always the same. Of course, if you do, um, if you do a bread uh, with bio, bio bread, etc., then it's not the same <coughs> quality and the prices doesn't mean anything anymore. If you pay one euro and then two euros, but if you do not buy the same thing, you cannot say that the price has been doubled. It has, been, uh, it has some probably progress, but you do not know what, what has happened concerning quality, right? The problem is that we do not know what is a unit of production concerning services. What is a unit of education? What is a volume of education? What is a volume of health? What is a volume of um, elder care? If you tell me one hour of work, I tell you this is not the volume of production, this is input. And we should not mix input and output. Otherwise you mix the, re the, the numerator and denominator of productivity. So you cannot use, you have to create new ways of measuring what production is. And unit of production, we still do not know what they are, actually. And in one of the books I have uh, written, I speak of, I don't know whether the name in exists in English or not. You, you, you'll tell me. I speak of statistical contortion. Means uh, uh, you want to to um, you want to um, to behave. You want to have services to behave as if they were goods, although they are not goods. Example. Sorry to to speak about funeral services. But I give you an example. I'm not sure to have all the English uh, vocabulary in mind. But okay, I will try. Funeral services, okay, are are more and more complex uh, 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 set of services that are supplied to uh, to people and to families. We do not know what a unit of funeral services is, because the quality is not stable and it depends on each supplier, etc., etc. But very often in funeral services, you use is what's the name of this stone used in funeral services? A marble. Marble? Marble? marble. 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 Okay. Marble. 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 <laughs> marble. Instead of using a unit, uh, instead of following the price of funeral services, we follow the price of marble. Strange, because is it, I mean, we, we are not sure that they follow the same path. But since we do not know what to use, because we need, uh, 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 we need a, a, a unit of production that is a standardized unit of, pro of production. I should have said standardized units of production. We do not know what to use, so we, we use marble. And we have a lot of different examples that may be used. In public services, we have absolutely no price because they are offered on a non-market way. So what do we use? 
we use wages. The evolution of wages is used as a proxy for the uh, price index of the branch of education. Strange. And if you, if you try to go to the end of my uh, explanation, it means, but I will not spend too much time on that, productivity in public services is more or less wage on wage. I mean that the variation of productivity is always, is always null. There are no gains of productivity in public services, which is not linked to the fact that we are lazy, but which is linked to the fact that the convention to measure output is a nonsense. But it's very important. And no one knows what convention to use. They, they test, at statistician test, and they try to, in, to have innovation. But for most of services, as we we'll say, Grilich, Grilich, which is an, an American working for the Bureau of, of Economic Analysis, Grilich says that for 70% of the service activities, we have complete intuition and estimation of what the production value-added volume is. 70% it's, it's is very much, because it's 70% of 70% of GDP. So it means half half GDP and half growth is just an estimation which, which is found on only statistician hypothesis and statistician hypothesis is always, they always try to make as if services would behave like goods and manufactured goods. All right. And this is a very major internal critique which remains confined within very close circles. In France, you have two people working on that, Jean Gadret, who in 1996 wrote a book, not translated into English, uh, Service Productivity Questioned, or <coughs> question. and, and you also had uh, Pascal Petit, who also wrote some stuff uh, from the regulation school on that, that topic. In the United States, you have more people, but those people um, are regarded as being a statistician from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and, and especially uh, <coughs> Bosworth. If, if, if ever you want to, 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 to deeply study the stuff and, and, and triplets. And also Greenwich and Gordon also has all very much discussed about the, the, the stuff of, of productive services, productivity in services and the, the, the problem, the, the statistical problem of uh, measuring uh, volume and, and price indexes in, in services, which is really, a, I don't know the term in English, but casted, broken head, which, has, uh, which of course means nothing. Okay. So these were very, very rapidly sketched, the major internal critics. Of course, you also have major external critics. These external critics are um, handled by more, um, more various sets of actors. The actors that would criticize GDP uh, comes from uh, the civil society, I have in mind, of course, the ecological movement. And more, uh, some sociologists. I have in mind Dominique Meda in France. And, and very, very few economists. Very, very few economists. The problem of criticizing GDP for economists, being lit for internal or external reasons, um, mean that they have nothing to work about anymore, <laughs> in a way, even for post keynesian actually, which would uh, probably be a major uh, controversy between me and my heterodox colleagues. But I like them very much. 
so the major external critiques are uh, are diverse. The first the first thing they they criticize is the fact that uh, GDP has become an autopilot system. Uh, GDP was a good mean, a good means to measure or to estimate the economic activity of a country, which is very useful, very useful to have an idea of what is the density of <coughs> economic activity, and from a mean, it has become the finality. From a mean, now it has become the finality. If you do not know, they say, if you do not know why you wake up in the morning politicians know why you wake up in the morning it's to have growth right and of course i could have given you a different uh, uh, verbatim from different authors politicians uh, sarkozy Ségolène royal and also obama who all would aim at getting more growth in the country that the first set of explanation so of course you cannot understand the external criticisms if you don't know if you do not understand the fact that the criticisms take takes for granted the fact that GDP is used as as a finality. So GDP is more or less regarded as well-being. More GDP equals more well-being. Okay? And and, and growth is regarded as progress. More growth equals more progress. And of course, you have to keep this in mind to understand the external criticisms. It is not the, the tool that is criticized, it is the way it is used nowadays, right? <coughs> right, the second thing. Um, uh, second idea. The second idea is um, the fact that, uh, of course, the critiques I will present you are not new. The critiques are reactivated. Because if you read the history of, the, of GDP and, and even in, in political economy, uh, of the 18th and 19th century, um, and, on, and concerning Kuznets, for instance, in, in, in 1930s, in the 1930s, they all had in mind the fact that um, um, measurement would, of, of course, um, uh, have difficulties to un to encompass every dimension they wanted to encompass. So they were very much aware of that. We could not say that they were naive in a way. And Kuznets, uh, is, this is very, very clear in what he writes, Kuznets was very much aware of the fact that GDP could not be regarded as the equivalent of well-being. So he was very much aware of the fact, for instance, that there would be very many costs of urbanization Uh, uh, in particular, what what they call what, what you call communicate co uh, commuting, that would be a cost that should be uh, uh, subtracted from GDP to have a better idea of what GDP means in terms of well-being. But this the. These critiques are reactivated and they have been reactivated since the 1919. This is very clear in Blanchard's uh, uh, articles, for instance, um, and also in the book we have written with Jean Gadret uh, in uh, 2006, uh, Macmillan. And with the title, The New Indicators of Wealth and Development. In this book, we try to clearly uh, identify the fact that uh, nine, 
in the 1990s is very much the beginning of a new movement um, reactivating criticisms and, con and parallelly um, uh, producing new indicators, alternative indicators. So criticisms, criticisms very often go hand in hand with, new, with alternatives. There are four critiques. I recall them to you, or I, 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 I tell them to you for the first time. I don't know what is your, your level on that. First, GDP, and this is not new, is the sum of value added. In other words, more is always better, as I said earlier. More production of whatever you produce is always better, is always good. Whatever production you have, and this may explain the controversy in Italy with production of um, of prost prostitution being part of, of GDP or uh, traffi drug traffic or even production of psychotrop or even production of, uh, of maintenance concerning uh, ecological uh, degradation, etc., etc. Et Whatever is produced, more is always good and is always better. The second idea and of course, this is only a problem if GDP is used as a finality. If you are obsessed with the fact that we should have more GDP at the finality, not as a tool per se. The tool per se just explains you that you have more economical activities. The second idea is that um, its border, and this is of course something I have al already stressed uh, upon, its borders are conventional, the border of the GDP, and they lack some major activities. They lack some major activities that may be seen, of course, I am not uh, legitimate to individually tell you that, uh, that they should be added within uh, uh, GDP, but they like GDP lacks some activity that may be seen <coughs> as <coughs> that may be seen as positive regarding uh, 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 collective well-being. These activities are domestic activities. I do not come back to this idea I have already stressed upon, domestic activities. And the second one is and the second one is um, I don't know the time. Benevola? Volunteering. Uh, a volunteer, right, this is it. Vontibus. Merci beaucoup. Volunteer activities. Volunteer activities, per, per definition, is, is, is necessary an activity which is non marketable and non monetary. Because it is the, the identity of voluntary activities. But we may collectively acknowledge the fact that these activities produce well-being. They, their value is equal to zero. As the activity, domestic activities realized by women, they equal zero. So voluntary. If we had in mind to put the values on those activities, Monetary value. You see what I mean? These activities escape from GDP. Okay, they are not they, they are not taken into account. If we put the values on those activities, a monetary value, 
We have possibilities. I mean, we have cognitive possibilities of doing that. We, we measure the time spent on these domestic activities and for each hour, we put a wage. So this can be very easily done. Do you have any idea of the amount of activities this would represent? Do you have any idea? How much, is, uh, how much does represent domestic activities, for instance, in France? If, if we compare it to GDP, is it 1% of GDP? Is it two times GDP, five times GDP? Is it half time the GDP? Do you have any idea of that? No? Okay. 10%? 10%? One third. Right. Huh? One third. Yeah, it's one third. So it represents one third of GDP. At, at least if we take into account some hypothesis, which is what has Delphine Roy in France, in France has done for the account of the Stiglitz Commission, who spoke very much uh, about this, uh, this uh, monetarization of domestic activities. One third of GDP. And some other estimation gave from half to 70%. For instance, uh, Shadow and, and, and Fouquet in, in the 18, uh, 1980s. So it represents very much activities voluntary, represent from 2 to 5% of GDP. If, of course, we put a monetary value on that activity, which, is, which may also uh, be controversial. But they contribute to wealth, and for the moment, they are uh, represented as being equal to zero. Third, third uh, very important um, uh, criticism is the fact that GDP is completely ignorant of inequalities. <coughs> More growth doesn't tell you anything concerning the way the, the wealth are allocated among class. Absolutely nothing. And I give you an Obama uh, verbatim. He, during a speech in February uh, in, in two, 2014, he said, uh, when nearly all the gains of the recovery, which means of growth, huh? ne when nearly all the gains of the recovery have gone to the top 1%, of population, when income inequality is at uh, as high a rate as we've seen in decades, I find that hard to swallow. So what he says is that between 2008 and 2014, all the growth that occurred in the United States was completely taken in the hand of the first, what we call the first centile, the top 1% of the population. And what happened between 1998 and 2008, it was all the growth that occurred in this period, in this decade in the United States, was captured in the hand of the, of the 10%. So what it, what it means here is that for all the rest of the population, either their living, standards, their living standard was stable or was, de was decreasing, right? So growth doesn't mean very much concerning, uh, concerning uh, 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 red red redistribution or allocation of this uh, wealth. And the most important I mean, should I say most important? Okay. Uh, one, important, um, one important element, and it is the fourth critique, which of course is very much uh, uh, activated by ecologists, is the fact that GDP is a, a flow is an indicator of flows, and it's not an indicator of stocks, absolutely not. And there may be, uh, there, there may be a lot of uh, performance concerning the flow, so there may be a, a good pace 
of growth because of depletion of the stocks, strong dep depletion of the stocks. And you may even think that to get, to get growth, so high pace of flow, this would be on the, um, uh, on the depend of, of the dip, uh, uh, irreversible depletion of stocks. Of course, the stocks I have in mind are ecological stocks. And economists have high difficulties to think in terms of irreversibility, ecological stocks, but also st social stocks. Will we be together in a position to be, to, to be society in 100 years, or a collection of individuals? What will be the possibility of being uh, engaged in the society for not for your own, not only for our own interest, but also to have a cohesion, social cohesion? We do not know, but we may also create irreversibilities on this side. It is what Meda shows in her in her different works Ab about the intellectual context. I have to say that things have very much changed for the last years and of course I wanted to show you a, s a very nice uh, uh, graph but I have not the possibility nor the time to present it to you and to draw it on the blackboard so I will just tell you a few things first I really think that the what we call the Stiglitz Commission has um, given uh, the possibility of, uh, of uh, scientifically work on that topic of limits of GDP and alternative way of measuring wealth and development. The, the Stiglitz Commission in 2008 and 9 gave a sort of a caution, a sci scientific caution On, on the limits of GDP <coughs> but, but of course <coughs> but of course um, it gave a scientific question on the limits of GDP but there may be some criticisms on the socio-political conditions of uh, production of the reports. The social political conditions of production of the reports. Of the report. Because uh, the reports of the Stiglitz Commission, which was a commission with the very many Nobel Prizes, uh, five Nobel Prizes, mostly economists, uh, they were, they spent uh, one year and a half on the measurement of uh, uh, economic uh, performance and social progress. And very cleverly, Amartya Sen, who was one of the uh, Nobel Prizes uh, uh, in, in the Commission uh, said within an interview uh, we are uh, it's almost this we are we are discussing about the world we want we are discussing about the world we want and he was true because these sort of indicators once they are legitimate, once these indicators are legitimate, they become way of interpreting words.
they interpret the world. It is a way, a quantitative way to interpret the world. If you have growth, you have progress. If you have GDP, you have wealth. And then this way of making some equivalence just becomes substitute in the way we speak. And, and this is very important to have in, to keep in mind the fact that most macroeconomic indicators are ways of interpreting words. So when Amartya Sen said we are discussing about the world we want, he was true. Now the question is, who is legitimate to discuss about the world we want? Who is we? Who is we? This is a question economists never raise, never, never. You have to have a dialogue between economists and sociology to have the legitimacy and, or even the idea of thinking, uh, who is legitimate? What are the processes that legitimate the fact that, etc., etc. So, so the, the things have uh, changed a bit and, and, and we, for instance, uh, there, are, there are more and more uh, theses that, are, uh, um, that have started since the Stiglitz Commission working on new indicators of wealth and development. This was never the case before. And we, we, see, we clearly see the, the power of a legitimate commission on stuff that had been discussed for decades before and they gave suddenly a scientific caution to something and then it becomes a legitimate topic. Probably if we had done this discussion with only citizen the issue would probably have not been as efficient. This is a this is something we could discuss about. I'm not sure, but this is something we could discuss about. The French Parliament uh, has also discussed about uh, a, a law proposition by uh, someone from the Ecological uh, Party in France, Eva Sass, in 2014, concerning uh, the, the taken into account of new indicators of wealth and development, based on, 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 on some works. I, I had the, the pleasure to, to, to do in, in the northern part of France. And uh, the Chinese government also gets involved. The Chinese government gets more and more involved in this uh, stuff, but I do not want to, to speak too much time, to spend too much time on that. I just want to, to finish this part with the idea of uh, there had been um, uh, an academic consecration. This is Eloi Laurent who told me that, and I find this idea very interesting. There is sort of an academic consecration after the Stiglitz Commission <coughs> with a paper published in the Revue Nature in 2004. It is the first time that within a very scientific uh, a journal uh, the question of uh, time to leave GDP behind is being raised. Time to leave GDP behind. I am sure that although nothing is new within this article, nothing is new within this article, any of you and me could have written this paper. It could never have been published before 2009, before the intellectual caution, scientific caution given by the Stiglitz Commission to the everything I told you before, to the limits, internal and, and external limits to GDP when used as a proxy of well-being. I have absolutely no idea of what is the time. No. Half past three. Is that right? Half past three. Okay. <laughs> and you want yeah. you want to discuss what I want what I have said? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for your presentation. We're going to try to uh, have a discussion. So we uh, didn't have your slides, but actually it uh, kind of makes sense uh, because. Uh, we had uh, we had an article, a recent article from 2013, 
uh, of you is uh, Dominique Meda, mm -hmm. who is uh, from uh, Sociology of Philosophy <coughs> and uh, uh, the article kind of starts where your presentation ends, so exactly. I think it makes sense to, to continue the discussion in uh, this way. And uh, the article is um, discussing uh, the Stiglitz and Fiducia report of 2009 and whether it has changed the paradigm of measuring wealth and welfare. And uh, it discusses the report and some attitude of the economists regarding measuring welfare in general. And it reviews some interesting recent initiatives of new indicators. And uh, yeah, so there is both a theoretical discussion of how to measure welfare and why, and uh, uh, some uh, new initiatives that can uh, help us discuss what the what is going to change or not in the future. So uh, first, I will present the briefly the report in its context, and then I'll give the floor to Shao Chan, who's going to. Uh, summarize quickly the articles and uh, the, and then we are uh, going to discuss the pos possible future of welfare indicators. Maybe uh, say some critiques and then ask some questions. So first, well, you um, you you already said that in your presentation. But yes, the report was uh, set up by President Sarkozy in 2008. And it was delivered in 2009, had a great scientific legitimacy, and helped build this topic to the center of the discussion. And um, the report uh, states some new ideas, like the importance of uh, uh, new dimensions of welfare apart from GDP, and in particular things like the environment. But uh, our article argues that in some ways it doesn't go far enough. So we are going to, to, to discuss it in the critiques. And um, yes. Okay. Okay, um, I summarized very fast about what we work on in the paper by our <laughs> lecturer. Mm -hmm. And um, the structure is like this. First, uh, she talked about the definition. So we have one here, have so, so okay, you can okay. keep it for your <laughs> own uh, use, and we use this one for collective use. Okay. Um, uh, firstly, uh, she talked about the definition of national well-being, and um, she did a very comprehensive and uh, very deep uh, literature review, starting from Adam Smith and talking about uh, how the economics um, point of view has changed our me measurement, uh, like reducing wealth to simply production. And uh, some of the first uh, phase um, um, opinions, like there's no need for public deliberation since individual objectives are what matter and institutions like the market guarantee the social order. And then uh, um, it goes to the re uh, quest for individual utility and then she talked about the per, uh, prohibition on the pref uh, preference aggregation. The main point is like uh, the individual preference cannot be simply uh, aggregated. It's very <coughs> subjective, and it's uh, it can be a uh, there can be a lot of pro uh, problems if we try to just do sim uh, very simple aggregation to measure the collective well-being. Um, and also the title of the uh, Stiglitz um, Commission report, it's uh, in French, if we translate it into English, it's the wealth of nations and well-being of individuals. Um, it suggests that only, okay, so it suggests wealth is a word for nations and well-being is a word for individuals. So there uh, is kind of the dichotomy, uh, I don't know the word, but you know it's, uh, it, it indicates that as for the well-being of the nations, we should now consider whether it can be really captured by instruments other than GDP. Um, then our um, lecturer, <laughs> read that, uh, uh, she just uh, summarized what uh, the Commission report said about how to summarize national well-being, and uh, there 
major, uh, their main uh, point of view is like time to write for our measurement system to shift uh, the emphasis from measuring economic uh, production to measure people's well-being. Um, and in terms of measures the national well-being, a plural, uh, plural system is suggested to use, um, start from material well-being, like income, salary, and then um, the commission suggested to use uh, both <coughs> Uh, two, two kinds of dimensions. First is objective and then the subjective dimensions. It's like uh, um, some methods um, including surveys and questionnaires like ask you whether you are happy about working, ask about your job satisfaction and other stuff. It's very subjective measurement and uh, the report think such a dual procedure must be uh, implemented and um, we consider both individual states uh, as well as the external factors such as the environment. <coughs> and for the third um, chapter, it's about how to measure quality of life. I will show another slide to you uh, to compare the point of Stiglitz and his colleagues and our speakers today to see the difference. And then uh, <coughs> the paper goes to indicators for the new concepts of social wealth, and then it's a conclusion. Uh, I don't want to repeat the um, uh, most part of her paper, but uh, I want to draw the comparison. Mm -hmm. OK, mm -hmm. so it's about how to measure quality of life. And the commission reports um, strongly calls for a better understanding of its determinants, like what determines the quality of life, and they proposing dimensions like access to political freedoms, participation in political life, and social connections. Uh, but our speaker, uh, Madame Jeanne uh, Catfis, uh, <laughs> it's hard to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering which is the surname, and then I found it's a double surname. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, I so have a husband. This is the reason. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the point in the paper uh, was, um, although the Stiglitz and the other member of the commission, they mentioned different um, determinants and dimensions, but there is no um, discussion about links between the various dimensions, and then. Um, she raised uh, the links that actually uh, can be collected points, which might be very interesting to option A students. Finally, comments show up and <laughs> <laughs> think about Alstrom and other <laughs> big names we heard about uh, from Professor Kaliya's class. Uh, and also, um, this report, the commission report, uh, attached little attention to the role of social cohesion. But it is very important thing because it, it can be affected very much by the uh, widening in, in, uh, in equalities. Um, okay, as for the indicators of uh, for a new concept of social wealth, and um, the commission reports recognize there is a widening gap between <coughs> economic growth and the social uh, perception of the progress, but uh, um, but just like the other um, economists uh, who have talked about the topic before, the remedies that they proposed uh, is still to just uh, mention the um, question at a cognitive level before adding it to um, ethnical and political levels, and it's a it's a great progress that they introduced. Uh, subjective indicators, um, but the protection of common goods are not mentioned, and uh, sustainability issues are still uh, incom uh, incompatible with, with, if, uh, with the individual utility theory, like if, if, we, if our uh, theory, um, framework of theory is uh, still about individual satisfaction, utility, and then there can be tragedy of commons and uh, there is no guarantee for the sustainability of common goods. 
And if we want to measure a well-being of the whole society, a collective well-being, then such kind of aspect should be taken into consideration. And if we go to the operation levels, then a, a, a question show up: What kind of indicators we're going to choose if we if we try to um, use something other than GDP? Like there can be two options. First is we include a compa uh, comprehensive indicators, like we choose a couple of indicators and just uh, use them at the same time. But the other one is one single flagship indicator comprising lots of dimensions. And which would you prefer? But our lecture, I don't know whether your opinion has changed or not, but you think... My opinion always change. <laughs> <laughs> in the paper... Uh, it's, it's, it's a process of research, so... Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the paper, it seems to um, be supportive of a single indicator out of the <coughs> necessity to compete with the GDP indicator and other stuff. And we have a problem, uh, we have a question about that, I uh, wish you were later. <laughs> okay. Mm. Oh, okay. Later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, now I'm going to the part of the possible future of welfare indicators. So really starting from the paper, but trying to, uh, to launch a discussion. Uh, I think wha what I found very <coughs> interesting in the paper is that it really goes to the deep uh, ideological and theoretical and philosophical foundations at the basis of GDP and it tries to discuss it and uh, the paper also shows that the 2009 report didn't uh, change the fundamental ideas behind GDP and um, because there is a kind of idea of political and philosophical neutrality that mainstream economists have that the that the report keeps and it's uh, it, it's actually um, not uh, not neutral and uh, based on some <coughs> idea of a utilitarian conception of welfare <coughs> and uh, how uh, the well-being of individuals can be summed up and summarized uh, at the collective level and the individual well-being would be enough to measure social welfare. So, um, uh, well, while I share the critique, I think that it's, uh, it's good to go back to uh, philosophical uh, ideas to design welfare indicators. Um, uh, still, it's, uh, it raises questions of how to, to measure new uh, New indicators and uh, also, like we, like you discussed in your presentation, uh, who is to design these indicators? And uh, the paper mentions some initiatives in some regions of France where people were consulted and were asked what should be taken into account in the new indicators. And uh, this would uh, because as well-being is a, is a democratic and political question and not only a scientific one. It makes sense to make people participate, but uh, we, we have some questions uh, for, uh, in the question part at the end about that. So, um, and uh, while, uh, while the theoretical foundations of GDP and uh, the global utilitarian paradigm has not been changed by the 2009 report still, there have been several initiatives uh, on the well-being measurement this last year, so uh, in in some uh, countries and in some international organizations, uh, <coughs> also some websites had the uh, had the uh, pages like you build your own indicator where you could put what interests you and create an indicator and rank countries and regions. So I'm not listing them all because we have to speed up a little bit. Now, uh, okay. um, we have some critics, but uh, one thing I want to emphasize before uh, we say some um, something <laughs> not positive enough is that uh, we we must uh, think about uh, the great significance that uh, both the commission paper and our speaker's paper and, and other uh, papers around this initiative has um, have bared. Because uh, it really comes at a necessary time, uh, as the one of the reasons about crisis might be 
it says too much excess and too much um, emphasis on the GDP. Uh, and their work provides a different angle ab about measuring our society's well-being, and um, this is just the start of an initiative, and it will take many years to develop, but at least it's a good start. Um, we have some uh, questions about this paper and uh, the Commission report, and we agree on the necessity of holistic approach, but it's, it seems very hard to measure, and most of the disputes it seems have um, concentrated on the feasibility of such kind of initi uh, initiative. And also, uh, we talked about uh, a composite index, but uh, if we want to make such kind of index, then how about the weighting issue? We have different mm -hmm. dimensions, like you, what you mentioned, the common, common goods, stocks, and sustainability, mm -hmm. and social cohesion. Then what? Uh, how to share the weightings, and if we just invite a couple of citizens uh, to do a survey around them, and they have a weighting, but their weighting system might, might not be applicable to other. You wouldn't uh, agree with the option B <coughs> or option C system if, uh, if, if they survey you. So it's, there can be a arbitrary or a some a priori uh, judgment, uh, value judgment, and that's an uh, issue. Uh, to be solved, and uh, also um, it's very interesting that your paper has included comments uh, into the measurement, and uh, it's, um, I didn't read anything like this uh, in other kind of literature, and it's um, also very good for us to combining different uh, um, knowledges of different options, but. Uh, uh, we know that as for some global commons, there is intellectual spillover effects and it adds to the difficulty if we want to um, make it a, a comprehensive indicator. So I don't know how to really implement it. And also uh, about Ostorf and <coughs> Hunting's series, we, we mentioned that the, um, it's not necessary that uh, commons will become a tragedy, right? And there are different groups managing the commons <coughs> and then it means maybe some commons are, uh, matters to this group but for other groups maybe it's it's not mm. something really mm. really important. Uh, another critic, I didn't put it in the slides but I'm thinking about it because if you look at the um, program already developed from the previous slides, it seems a rich country club which means that uh, it seems to be um, started and being implemented among the countries which don't need too strong mm -hmm. GDP growth. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's uh, a question of rich countries, you mean? Um, mm -hmm. It's. it's it seems. So. Yeah. I don't know how to phrase it, so <laughs> I didn't put it into the slides. Okay. But uh, okay. uh, I think for developing countries, uh, developing countries, uh, it's it's really hard to for for them to follow the progress. Because apparently for them the most important task is still mm -hmm. to seek for the economic growth and how 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 we're going to integrate the developing world and the development uh, developed countries and to promote the political involvement and the official recognition of such methods. Mm -hmm. That's something I, I I hope I can get your. And uh, we can skip this one because we're late oh, already. Sorry, sorry. We discussed uh, GDP a lot okay, already. Okay. So and uh, about GDP, then there are some opinions uh, defending GDP. Uh, that doesn't mean that we, we agree with them, but. Uh, but you uh, want to defend it, okay. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. provide you with yeah, some okay, opinions. Just, okay, okay. Just we'll really let's go through it very, very quickly, maybe, because. Okay. Some argue that GDP actually is, is still an indicator of uh, human welfare and uh, it has very strong relation with uh, other uh, welfare indicators like life uh, expectancy and inequality. And on, uh, also the presumption of uh, uh, the other people's work to substitute GDP is like uh, most people cannot benefit from GDP growth but from the empirical statistics actually most people did benefit from the GDP growth and also uh, we saw a lot of evidence that people's choices between labor and leisure demonstrate actually the value higher consumption in an absolute sense 
okay, my computer is fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, <laughs> no, just uh, a relative sense. So rising GDP per capita would be in accordance with people's desires and preferences. Okay, this is just for your references. And for our questions, okay, maybe you want to talk about okay. it. Well. Mm -hmm. So, um, some, uh, I was, uh, I wanted to ask some questions about some of your suggestions to, to what to include in two of our indicators. Because indicators like quality of political participation of level of democracy in a country, the issue is, uh, usually in the literature, when there is this kind of indicators, it's, it's always equal to one or 100 percent for the USA, and all the other <laughs> countries on yeah. uh, level is defined compared to the USA. Yeah, so in sociology, they call it an ethnocentrism. Yeah. So uh, how to avoid it? Is it possible to have an absolute benchmark of what a good political system is? Uh, I I doubt it, but I, I mean it's Im I believe that it's important to include part political participation, but I wonder if it's possible quantitatively to measure it on some benchmark scale, which would not be ethno ethnocentric. Also, if uh, if we want to, to be democratic about the definition of new indicators and ask the, actually the people, well, um, uh, I'm afraid from, from political sociology, I'm afraid that uh, it would be not 100% mm. of the population that would join, it would not be mm. random people from the population. Obviously, from the sociology of political movements and all this, it would probably be the people f f with enough cultural capital, mm. people who have made studies with higher education, and that would be uh, probably with uh, upper social classes, which would be overrepresented. So, uh, so to me, uh, making making people participate, well, uh, it would not be all the people. So I wonder if it's fe feasible, or, or if, mm. uh, or if you think that this critique is a. Uh, challenges the idea of making people participate and yes and uh, if uh, and if you want to uh, to change radically how welfare indicators are made and to make them more holistic and uh, and to make a knowledge mainstream economics that their indicators are not actually neutral and, and more scientific Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. so yes yeah, so what should we do and uh, where to start and, uh, wh where is the where is it happening uh, I think that's all for Oh, we had more questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will just read one. Okay. This, this <laughs> where you I, was, I, I think. hope I have two hours to answer. So. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, there, there, is okay wow. there is one about the one composite index, so I wouldn't yeah. repeat. Uh, I, I would only highlight that the mm -hmm. issue about sustainability, and there mm -hmm. seems uh, to be some, some problem because uh, some suitable indicators for describing the evolution, uh, evolution of natural human social thoughts are still lacking in many fields. And I don't know in terms of operation how how it is possible to find the proper okay. indicators. And another thing is about the GDP. Okay, some people define the G GDP. So what's exactly is the relation of the new uh, indicator with the GDP? And you want to include the GDP in part of it, or just uh, you mentioned right. they include an other unnecessary stuff into GDP. So you prefer a natural GDP measurement plus. Uh, what you suggest in your paper, or you want to GDP remain in its way today. Okay, thank you very much. Wow, Yay. thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for your brilliant uh, uh, question and, and analysis of, of, of our paper, of my presentation. I didn't even have in mind the fact that uh, we said so many things ourselves. <laughs> so thank you very much for stressing on, uh, uh, on uh, at the same time, uh, uh, things that interested you and also some uh, paradox that may occur here and there. And also uh, on some uh, things we, we have to more stress to try to be a bit more underst understood in a way, if I may say so. Um, one of the difficulties I've had today is, uh, first of all, uh, I like speaking and second, uh, secondly, um, I am less productive when speaking in English and productive in an industrial term. So it's the number of words I pronounce per <laughs> minute. This is very much an indicator of industri in industrial terms. And uh, therefore I, I missed some stuff I would have really liked to present you that may have answered more or less some of the questions you raised, 
uh, on uh, actually at least two two elements or two dimension one is uh, maybe it's not exactly the questions you raised but it's the way I will uh, phrase it now is uh, how to produce legitimacy for new indicators because of course we may spend some time together and produce something <coughs> We have the databases with the big data movement and we may produce something together. But the question is how to get legitimacy out of something we produce. And, and this is very difficult. So what we saw in the literature and in the initiatives we, we either were involved in or we analyzed, um, uh, so what we saw were two streams of uh, legitimacy. One is the legitimacy of expertise. I insist on that because it's very important. Some indicators are just legitimate because they are, they are produced by people who were legitimate, who had legitimacy. And those are very often experts among the experts, economists have uh, are at the top of the ranking, and economics economists use their language, and their language of economists, the preferred language of economists is money. And therefore, when most most of the initiatives that are at the legitimacy of experts are initiatives that promote uh, new indicators using uh, the unit of accounts, the money. Within this category, I would put the w one of the initiatives you, you mentioned in your question, the World Bank uh, um, Adjusted Net Savings, mm -hmm. Adjusted Net Saving, ANS, mm -hmm. which is an indicator that try to have within the same amount capital economic capital, social capital, and natural capital. How do they aggregate? How do they make a comprehensive indicator of that? It's very easy. Money makes the unity in a way. And the weight is given by money, right? There are a lot of conventions behind how to measure natural capital. Should we measure the uh, services provided by biodiversity. To what extent uh, money is a good unit of account to count something that, is, that escaped market? These are very, very fundamental and philosophical uh, matters that we have to discuss together. And so who is the together? It's something very important. But very often the expertise especially the one given by, by, by economists. And here I have uh, no difficulty of putting in the same uh, category any economists. All economists use the language of money, or most of economists use the language of money. And, and, and there is a, a huge stream concerning or a huge tendency toward this monetarization of, 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 of all the capital, social capital, uh, natural capital and of course economic capital. There is another initiative that you did not mention which is the one promoted uh, since uh, Rio plus 20, Rio 20, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, promoted by the United Program uh, uh, of Environment, not, not of development but of, on, on environment and they promoted the Inclusive Wealth Index, EWI. Mm -hmm. And this inclusive wealth index is a proxy of the adjusted net savings, and they are more and more invested in uh, in the in the monetarization of nature. Of course, monetarization of nature does not mean marketing of nature. These are things that are different. In the one hand, you use the language of money to put value on something which escape the market and in, in, in the other hand you, you sort of uh, you, 
you m out of something that is uh, free, you make something that become a commodity. So these are two different things. Mm -hmm. But what Andre Orléans would told you, or would tell you, he would tell you, once you monetize, the spirits are ready for commodification, right? So this is something that still needs some exploration, uh, even in the literature, even in the history of economics. So this this was my this is the first uh, the first dynamics. There is another dynamics, another legitimacy dynamic, which is the legitimacy, the one you stressed upon, both of you which is the legitimacy of individuals. Since quality of life, well-being, sustainability are things very much subjective, in a sense, who is legitimate to say what would be a good measure? Individuals. They have the preferences, the individual preferences, to say whether they are happy or not, whether they are satisfied or not, whether they find or not that their life is of a good quality. And this is, this is very much the tendency, the trend of the economics of happiness, which is very uh, flourishing these days, with uh, Kahneman uh, in, in, in the United States and in France with Claudia Senik or uh, Andrew Cloud. And these people... Uh, uh, they, they stress upon the fact that this, there is an individual democracy. They use the term democracy. And they say the individual democracy legitimates the fact that we ask each of you whether or not you're satisfied with your life. Right? But of course, and this is something you stressed upon, and both of me, and I thank you very much on that, because this is something very important for us. If you, if you make an aggregation of all the individual satisfaction, and you say the, the, the mean satisfaction is the average of all individual satisfaction, you may go through very important things that are important to preserve collectively and that are not part of your individual satisfaction. And these are these commons that we call commons and that we are not the only one to call comments, right? There are strong tendencies with Dardo and Laval also with the last book on common, who speak about this uh, cleverly. And, and this, is, this is fundamental. I mean, if the average level of, ha of happiness in France in 2013 is 6.8, does that mean that we preserve comments? <coughs> and if it goes up to nine tomorrow, does it mean that we preserve commons? And the, here is a, here there is a notion of a, there is an epistemic epistemic notion. What Claudia Senik or or Andrew Clark would would say is that what imp, what is important is individual democracy. What we say is that it is not an individual democracy that is important, it is citizen democracy. And a citizen is not an individual. A citizen is, um, is an individual with a uh, 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 thickness of, of ethic and who is living in a city, citizen, and who, he, who has a sort of a consciousness of rights and duties of rights and duties and therefore when citizens maximize their satisfaction they take into account constraints of the city and therefore their maximization of their uh, satisfaction may be something different from the satisfaction of individuals because they integrate the idea of the 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 notion of, of, of living together, the notion of, uh, of, of goods, of common goods, etc., etc. This is an ideal uh, uh, framework, of course. I, I do not say that everyone behave as a citizen, but, but it's another way, another epistemic way of, of, of 
indeed tackling with indicators. And when you take into account the citizen democracy, then you try to do what Maria was, was uh, stressing upon earlier, is what we could call the deliberative democracy. And then it's very difficult to handle. I, I completely agree with you what you say concerning the upper class domination, in, even in the deli deliberative demo de uh, democracy. This may happen. This may happen. But, but what is better, to try to promote deliberative democracy or to say that experts have the right to tell what could a good society be? This is one alternative. I do not say that it is the only. Of course, it's a bit uh, uh, caricature in a way. But it's, it's, one, it's one alternative. So of course, there, there is a strong need to do experiments with this uh, uh, dem deliberative democracy. Actually, I also work, may, may you, can you give me this? I also work on, uh, on social and solidarity economics. And we, we have this question, which is very much raised in this context of uh, social economics, and of, on, on the notion of social utility, on the notion of social impact. Who is legitimate to measure the social impact? And we try to make some uh, uh, some experiment to try to promote deliberative uh, democracy. And we have these uh, very sm smart uh, 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 drawings that show how to how to to experiment the de deliberative democracy. Of course, I may. I may give some idea, I may arrive and, and discuss with other people, but I very much need to work with other disciplines. I need to work with political science. They are far more clever than I am concerning this point on, on how to develop a democracy, a demo, deliberative democracy, as Abermas would put it, for instance. But the experiment makes us progress, and we try to avoid the idea of a of, of, of the fact that a deliberative democracy is only a concern of elites or upper class. I do not say that we, are, we have been very efficient, but we try to do so. So uh, there is a real need for, 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 um, for experiment on this side of deliberative uh, uh, democracy. And I would very much have liked, not only for me, but for, the, for our democracy, that Stiglitz and, and, its, uh, and its colleagues stress upon, on that point. They may have said, OK, now it's time for experimentation. It's time to say how to deliberate collectively on what is important. And this also uh, is important concerning another point. You were, you were uh, stressing on a very important point, which is the point of the, uh, are the common goods we want to preserve the same in all, uh, in all um, uh, places, you, you, you raise this question. <coughs> and this is a very important question, which raises another set of questions. I do not have a lot of answers, but I have a lot of questions, which is, which is the good scale for building new indicators? What is a good scale? Should indicators be constructed only on a local scale? Because here we know what the common goods, here we know what the common goods we want to preserve, and of course, in South Africa, Ethiopia, Luxembourg, uh, Brazil, Brazil, France, North of France, maybe we do not have the same commons to preserve. We do not have the same priority, but here there is a big tension in the history of indicators. All indicators who became legitimate were universal indicators and who had this ethnocentricity as a huge problem that no one solved. Even when I produced an indicator for the northern part of France, which is called the Index of Social Health for the northern part of France, even some other regions of France could contest what we have produced, because they could say it is northern centered. In the south of France, we may not have the same priorities to give to social health.
But at the same time, if we want an indicator that competes a bit with other hegemonic indicators, we need some universality to uh, to to have an uh, to, to to have an to to hope that these indicators may may gain some legitimacy. What else did I want to stress upon uh, in, 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 in all the things you, very clever things you said? Um, <coughs> um, composite index and holistic measure. I think from time to time I change. This is my last sentence. I think that from time to time I, I change my mind because I, th I do not think there is one unique re response to give. We may think that in the short run, in the short run, to try to compete against very hegemonic indicators, some holistic measurement may be of interest. Maybe, uh, for instance, the indicators put forward by Osberg and Sharp in uh, 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 index of uh, economic well-being is very interesting. It's uh, plenty of things we could contest. But at the same time, it may for a time be a good competitor versus uh, GDP. But one very important uh, uh, problem of these, um, <coughs> of these holistic measures of, or of these composite index is not so much a question of weight. It is the question of substituability. If you have a, 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 if you have a common indicator in which you put economic, social, uh, social dimension and ecological dimension, you put that in the same aggregate. You say, if it progresses, it may be because the economic dimension progress or because the ecological dimension progress. And there may be compens and, and you make the hypothesis that there may be compensation between the two. And I have to acknowledge the fact this may be an implicit answer to what you said. I have to acknowledge the fact that any aggregate indicators encompass the idea of the weak sustainability. You know what weak sustainability means versus strong sustainability. And weak sustainability make the hypothesis of infinite technical progress because economic will always compensate uh, uh, nature depletion, social depletion. This is the strong hypothesis. Therefore, therefore, uh, even though from time to time I think, or I was thinking, or I still think that aggregate indicators may have uh, an effect, they also have probably more um, more weaknesses. Than, uh, than, 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 than they would be progresses. So I still think that composite index may be in interesting, but they may be interesting within dimension. C one composite index, for instance, for social progress may be interesting. One composite, composite in index for ecological issues, for instance, the ecological footprint may be interesting. One composite index for, GD, for, for economic uh, uh, dimension, but not one, one overall holistic measurement for all those dimensions. Otherwise, you make the hypothesis of this compensation between all the dimensions, and you encompass the idea of weak sustainability, which is not the one I want to encompass. Uh, when we, my last point, I come back to, to the deliberative democracy. Uh, we have very seldom uh, worked directly with uh, any citizens in our experiment. We have always worked with intermediate groups, always, what we call les corps intermédiaires in France, in French. So that means a representative of uh, of all groups, but we have worked with representative of with association who works with poor. We have worked with association that works with uh, for the defense of housing, droit au logement. We have worked with uh, uh, with association that defends the 
uh, women, etc., etc. And all these intermediate groups may be a good level to gain in, uh, in, in, in deliberative democracy. Okay. Thank you so much for your brilliant intervention. Thank you. Thank you. I would need more time to, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to explore more deeply uh, any of these aspects, but it may interest you for the following of your studies and research. I hope so. Professor, do we have time to take more questions? From yes, of course, I have time. Uh, I have two questions, actually. Uh, my first question concerns the sharing economy and sort of what your full opinion of that is and whether, uh, I mean, of course, there's less chance for people to gain uh, an income through this uh, system, but it's actually giving people a chance to save a lot and use resources that would otherwise not be used. So do you think that the sharing economy is a good indication that... Sharing economics means... Like the collaboration. Uh, collaborative uh, I'm talking collaborative about, economy, okay. Yeah, I'm talking about things like okay. the Vidlib system that can be attributed to the okay, sharing okay, economy okay, okay. or, you know, people cooking at other people's houses or whatever. Uh, that's my first question. And my second question is, uh, actually, I saw a TED talk about this guy that discovered replanting uh, landscapes that were once really arid and non-fertile anymore because of generations of farming. Uh, but now he's actually uh, finding ways to replant and re-engineer the landscape so that it continues to uh, bring ecology, uh, biodiversity to the area and people can use water finally and grow their own food. Uh, my question is, how would you explain to policymakers or economists that, uh, as a matter of fact, these farmers that once lived in these arid areas who used to cattle ranch all over the place are actually, you know, living a better economic life and a better uh, lifestyle with letting the cattle ranchers put their grazing uh, activities aside and letting, you know, nature finally grow and have human beings live at one with nature so that there is an abundance of food and water. Okay. I will uh, concentrate on the first question. Um, um, the, the sharing economy um, is uh, s so long is n it so long it is not only uh, designed uh, with too much new technologies is a very good concept for ecological transition right and very often uh, you may have a sharing economy with very low growth so low growth <coughs> is not incompatible with progress low growth is not incompatible with progress which is something that we all have in mind because we have been educated like that. If you do not have growth, you do not have progress. I think it's not incompatible. And I think that to a certain extent, the sharing economy might be or may be a good illustration of what could be an, 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 uh, uh, an economy with a very low growth but with progress because the sharing economy tries indeed not to have a growth in material, to, to, to save material things and to try to to um, to develop to multiply the the links between uh, between the producers and consumers so that's that is what I would I could say but this but but you the, the governance of, of this has to be thought about this is very important mm -hmm. now I will not an answer your second question because I'm not sure to have very well understood it but if you, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but at the same time, I, I, there is something very important they said that I had in mind when you, when you raised your question, it may answer indirectly, I don't know, uh, which, which is something you said concerning the, the defense of GDP. You said uh, GDP is directly correlated, for instance, with life expense, uh, expectancy. And therefore, why should we... Uh, why should we put GDP uh, aside? This is true only until a certain level. After, let's say, uh, uh, $20,000 per capita of uh, living standard, after that, being beyond that, you, you have absolutely no, not at all, any correlation anymore. Otherwise, I think no one would work 
on new indicators of wealth. So of course, everything <coughs> I have, have, everything I, I, I spoke about is the responsibility of rich countries. I speak, about, I, I speak in terms of responsibilities. It's not a concern, it is a responsibility. Of course, we have the responsibility <coughs> that uh, poor countries develop the way they want. I do not say develop with growth. Develop the way they want. But we also have the, the responsibility, the collective responsibility of stopping the invasive way we have grown for the last 50 years. And this is the, rich re the, the, the responsibility of the rich countries, absolutely not the responsibility of the poor countries. If I had time, if I had had time to, to, to show you some, uh, some elements concerning the ecological footprint, this would have been obvious to you. They have no responsibility in what is happening. Even actually, even China, although it's, 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 it's shifting to have responsibility. But the responsibility is within uh, Northern, uh, Northern uh, America and, 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 and Europe. I was wondering um, if you could comment on the example of Bhutan, because I know that in my, mm -hmm. my country, the Netherlands, it's used as the example in the political mm -hmm. and journalist arena. And I was wondering Okay. You could say something about that no. Okay. I, it's it's a, it's a very good question. Um, <coughs> actually, um, okay. Maybe you have understood the fact that I am not very much um, attracted by the indicators, happiness indicators. It's not my tasse de thé, as I would say in French, because uh, they are very much uh, grounded on individual. Uh, methodology and on utilitarist frameworks and on the idea that the sum of individual happiness would make collective happiness. Okay, so I, I um, sort of uh, put a distance with this, uh, <coughs> with this very strong uh, uh, wave of, of studies concerning that. But the way Bhutan uses happiness has nothing to do with the way it is measured in Western countries. Absolutely none. Uh, the, Bhutan, uh, the Bhutan happiness, uh, the, the, the gross happiness in Bhutan, or happiness, I don't know how the, the way it's used in, in, in English, but bonheur national brut in Bhutan, uh, is very much more um, um, an, um, an indic an, a composite index of different dimensions that are supposed to be components of the collective well-being of the country. So it is very much an indicator of well, as what we would call in, in our Western countries indicators of well-being. It is very efficient, but there is one uh, we, strong weakness to this indicator it is absolutely not uh, debated collectively. It is a, a top-down uh, top uh, process with the dictature uh, elaborating for the citizens what is good for them, right? But it has nothing to do with the subjective uh, indicators I was speaking of uh, earlier. So, in a sense, it is interesting it shows that it is feasible, but it is completely lacking mm -hmm. the democratic uh, dimension of the construction of the indicators, which is for me something very important. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's, it is also the way Bhutan is developing. So it's not the, it is not an example of democracy. So it's also. A, you also see that within the indicator they, and the way they, 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 they produce them. But I'm not sure that our societies are good democracies neither, because the, I could not say only because of that, but the way major indicators are elaborated is one indication of the fact, of the fact that economic is put very, very far from democracy. 
economic is the question of experts and democracy is a side, which is something I am completely opposed as, as an economist. But we are very few speaking, uh, thinking this way, very few. Mm. But still, I have another. Yeah, yeah please, please, please. <laughs> last one. It's a little bit less uh, easy to frame for me. But I was wondering to, oh, if we could zoom in a bit on the European uh, context and maybe the auster recent austerity policy. Because, uh, let's put it in this way. So I'm from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I would say by far the majority, is just jealous of the richness in much different ways of countries in the, like Spain, Italy, France, um, maybe in a very romantic way also, in the sense that there is nature, there is a better they quality are of life. Of, they are jealous of what? Sorry. Food, of uh, all kinds of things that they associate with quality of life that's not, in their opinion, existing in the Netherlands, a small country where everything... So the perception then is, we put everything in a certain marketized way, which is maybe contributing to the GDP, uh, a little bit running after Germany. At the same time. Yeah, yeah, that, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you so are very German. Yeah. Ah, no. <laughs> Sorry, I said sad things. <laughs> I'm used to it. It's ah. <laughs> right, sorry. I should have asked you <laughs> more. <laughs> who was who? <laughs> um, so I was wondering maybe if this balance of power in Europe could be very different if you have a very or a more diverse idea of well-being also in policy huh. well, maybe this That's is a, a good question. Yeah. I'm not sure to have a clever way of answering to this question, but this is a very good question. I don't know. I don't know. No, I, I, I have absolutely no idea. It's a, it's a very it's a very good question. I don't know. I don't know. It may it may have some impacts, but uh, after a certain period of time, it may change a bit mm -hmm. the way the, the way the priorities uh, are put and so on. But um, I'm not sure. I don't know. I have also a question because I really like this idea of that. Okay, GDP is actually this power kind of thing mm -hmm. between states, yeah, which is <coughs> yeah, exactly. It's super interesting. I never thought about this before. And then, um, okay, do you well, think I, I have? I've not been useless. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really good. Do you think actually, since okay, we have the developed countries and developing countries, that developed countries at some point might realize that just by using other indicators, they can become more powerful compared to developed countries. Yeah, of yes. course, of course. But why, why don't yeah. we do this? Why, why don't they use other indicators than just of running course, behind some, more and more some, groups? Some, 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 so, some countries, uh, I mean Bhutan, mm -hmm. for instance, or even in, in, in Brazil, in some, uh, in some uh, regions of mm -hmm. Brazil, they use alternative indicators saying we do not want to run yeah. after mm -hmm. developed countries and we want to have our, our own path of development mm -hmm. with another model. And for this, we need mm -hmm. other indicators. If the if the if the GDP remains the main hegemonic indicator, mm. they will all finish with the same model of development. So uh, we know some experiment in Brazil mm. who shows their their willingness, for instance, not to uh, destroy the, uh, the the Amazonia and therefore trying to mm. figure out other indicators to to preserve their their common goods. It's, it's this is very important. Mm. But at the same time, is it... And maybe oh, also for, for developed countries, like for Europe. Because we, we're trying in Europe to get more growth. We, we're fighting against unemployment, trying to put as much money in the economy as possible mm. just to make some growth from somewhere. Um, which I think is completely ridiculous because I feel like that... St or the heads of the governments feel like they need to have this growth in order to justify that they have power because then they lose no, their yeah, power yeah, against true. China, against it's America. Right. Like, oh my God. So, I'm w <coughs> we may also think that it was one of the ideas behind the head of Sarkozy. Mm. I have difficulties to find growth, so I will change the yeah. the measurement. But this may this this is something uh, I'm not very uh, excited of saying in a way because it's it, it's a way of uh, of saying that uh, indicators may be manipulated. Mm -hmm. By the by 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 politics, and 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 what I try to 
what I try to analyze is the fact that they have always been convention. These conventions are very useful because all indicators are um, collective agreements, mm -hmm. even inflation, for instance, mm -hmm. is, is a collective agreement. We all agree on the fact that inflation is 1%, 2%, and no one contests it, whereas we could contest it because it's plenty of conventions. But some, from time to time, within a society, it's very important to have collective agreements, and some indicators are collective agreements. But from time to time, it is time to open the black box mm -hmm. and to discuss and have controversies concerning things that were our aims and that are not good aims anymore. But, uh, but it would be important to also have the, um, the dynamics that would help us um, construct um, alternatives mm -hmm. that would become <coughs> again collective agreements. The worst for me would be to say, okay, GDP is very conventional, mm -hmm. I have no faith anymore in any indicators. This would be the worst. We need collective agreements and these go th through some indicators. But from time to time we should change. If each political arise with this set of indicators saying, okay, I am interested in this indicator because I know that with these indicators I should mm -hmm. have a good, uh, a good, uh, I, I should be performant in a way then no one would uh, have any faith in any indicator anymore. Manipulation yeah. is not something good. So we also need institutions that also uh, make a distance between the politics that are in place and the indicators that are produced. <coughs> mm. True. If, are there any other questions before Christmas period? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you uh, may have another lecture after me tonight? No, no. no. <laughs> no. 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 I just wanted to ask how do we do the legal activities in GDPs that you mentioned? Sorry? Like, how did you include the illegal activities? Illegal? Mm -hmm. Illegal activities normally are not part of GDP. It is, the o it is the only activity that escape that is avoided from GDP. No, you mentioned prostitution and drugs. Yeah, it's drugs. Uh, yeah, but Italy is a special case. Ah, okay. In informal activity, informal activity is included. Informal activities. There is an estimate of informal activities, but there is no estimate of illegal activity normally, yeah, ex except for for Italy. If I mm. if I <laughs> get it right. Okay. <laughs> You may study this. <laughs> you may he, study this. From Italy. Yes. yes, but there is no other country which includes this. Uh, yeah, but uh, prostitution, when it's legal, it's, it's included, right? In it's the GDP. In Italy, it's not. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's not. They don't pay taxes. taxes. And Italy, they don't pay taxes, but no. it is legal. It is legal. Oh, okay. But it's not legit. Uh, it is not regulated. Yeah, it's not regulated, exactly. Ah. So okay. it's allowed. I would not even say it's legal, it's allowed. Yeah, it's like allowed. Okay. But yeah. No tax, so no like, protection, taxes? no benefits, <laughs> no, no governmental. Like, okay. Okay. okay, thank you very, very no, much. It was thank a you. pleasure thank to you. speak to you. Uh, and thank you to David Fletcher who invited me here. It was a real pleasure. Thank you to both of you. It was <laughs> very, 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 very